Well, it's um, good to be here, and I will respect the time constraints uh, for sure. 25 after uh, 1, I will uh, cease. I have at the moment 6 minutes to 1. Synchronized watches. Um, no one leave till then. We'll watch the doors. Um, I want to talk a, a bit about the spiritual search today, um, something that I think that we're all interested in. When I start to talk about spirituality, some uh, immediately a lot of people tune out and think that's for priests, nuns, monks, people like that. But when I'm talking about the spiritual search today, I have in mind very concrete instances. Uh, I always say I learn more from my counseling practice than I ever did in studying theology or being with Karl Rahner and all that. Pick up, uh, that's my real interest in where people are at, what they're going through, common human experience and so on. So when I start thinking about uh, the search today, spiritual search, I think of the professor who comes to me and says, uh, I'm going to have lunch, let's talk this over. He says, I feel in my life it's like this. i got so many activities. i got this and that family. I'm involved here there. I need a focus for all that. I need something that pulls that all together. My friend, the professor involved in the spiritual search, I think. I think about uh, the middle-aged man that comes to see me and says, uh, I'm in big trouble, Father. Um, you know, I've been running around with this other woman. And to tell you the truth, what's behind it is the blahs. Everything just seemed dull to me. It's uh, nowheresville. I can't get excited about anything. He says, but uh, somehow this other woman sparked something. He says, a lot of times I'm way with her. It's not even a sexual matter. It's just somehow an excitement about be, uh, being in this other situation. And he says, I've got to figure out how to get out of this and to how to get over these blahs in this crummy situation that I'm in. I think about the graduate student who comes to see me and says, Father, I need a model for my life. That's what I really need is a model, some uh, option about how life can be lived. And I knew as he was talking to me, that he was really checking me out. He was trying to see how there could be a person that he somewhat liked and felt was intellectually honest and who was into religion as well. And he was trying to figure out how some person could actually combine those two things, intellectual honesty and uh, living out this life as a Catholic priest. And so he tells me, I'm looking for a live model, uh, an example of how you could put those things together in life. No, I think of um, the dentist friend of mine who uh, tells me that he was uh, turned his life over to the Lord on, on May 3rd and went along that way for a while. And as he was going along, he found out that he thought it would all be smooth sailing from then on after he turned his life over. And now he was finding a rocky road. And he said to me, you know, I need help to continue to grow in this Christianity that I've become serious about. My dentist friend involved in the spiritual search. I think of the woman who tells me that she's married to an atheist, a guy who isn't into religion at all, and she comes to Mass on Sundays, and he doesn't really want her to go, gives her a lot of static. And she says, you know, when I don't get there, I feel so empty inside. She says, when I go there, I get filled up somehow, and I need that in my life. And so she says, uh, I want my husband to understand that because I go there, somehow I'm a better wife and a better mother to our children. And when I think about uh, this spiritual search from my own viewpoint, I often use a phrase from the poet Yeats about a center that holds. And I talk about uh, the fact that in my own life I experience all these tugs and pulls on my time. I mean, some guy calls me up and says, I need a speaker in one week. You know, <laughs> get over here. <clears throat> Drive your car there. I said, how am I going to get there? So my mother comes with me here. I, I got to watch what I say today. My mother's listening here. Uh, clean up this talk. <laughs> so I mean, I, these tugs on my time. I mean, everyone wants to pick my brains. Come and see me. Um, need you to, to do this. Come and join our program. Say mass tonight at 9:30 for this group of collegians. Get over in the dorm. Just pull all the time. And the question is, how does one find a center of energy and strength inside oneself that will allow one to keep going, to make it over the long haul in life, to somehow not get burned out, to be able to keep functioning uh, in this job that I've got, a search for a center that holds. 
Well, my hope is that, that somebody, everybody in the room would be able to identify with those kinds of situations. You see, my conviction is that the spiritual search doesn't have just to do with reading the Bible, although that's important, not just with going to Mass, although that's crucial for many of us, but it's got to do with life, of learning to live life better. Uh, it has to do with finding some meaning in the midst of the absurdity that's always threatening us. It has to do with finding something we're committed to, like Martin Luther King said, something I'm willing to die for in the midst of the blahs. It's a matter of trying to find some integration or wholeness in my life, some way to pull it all together when I feel scattered in so many different directions, tugs and pulls. Irenaeus made a comment, he said, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. And I think that's what the spiritual life has to do with, finding greater maturity, gathering our forces, being an effective person in our world, having some sort of focal point for all of my activities, knowing where I fit in the big picture, having a sense of purpose in a world that often seems so confused. So when I'm talking about the spiritual search, it has to do with all of those kinds of things. You can put it in more religious terms if you want. You can say that the spiritual search has to do with finding a richness in our Catholic heritage that will enable us to live as effective adults in the modern world. No, we can say that it's a matter of finding a richness in our Christian heritage that will enable us to be authentic people and feel not like we're split one way on Sunday and another way during the week. One way when you talk to a clergyman and another week when you're talking uh, over a beer after the golf game. Uh, some way to get a sense of integration in one's life, a sense of authenticity so that we don't feel out of sync with ourselves. So maybe we talk about it as finding the Lord in our lives and making Jesus Christ more real to us, finding a sense of dedication. Now, one way or another, you ought to be able to plug into that. And if you can't, then it's my fault for not uh, saying it in a way that really touches your situation. But that's the way life is. We got the restless heart. You know, nothing in this world seems to satisfy us completely. We got to know where we fit. We got to have a sense of purpose. We have to find some meaning. We have to have a religious focus for what's going on. That's essential to us as human beings. Those people who say God is dead, those people who talk about religion as being passe are crazy. You know, every time you do that and you get in a secularized culture where we have what I call the eclipse of mystery, where people don't sense the mystery dimension of life, then we feel uh, out of sorts. There's something wrong. We're not in tune. That's why we get more fatigued than we ought to get. Culture like that will breed a religious revival. God is dead as a bunch of baloney. As we all know today, we are finding this revival of religion all over the place. And that's because we are essentially religious creatures, because as Augustine said, we've got the restless heart. The heart remains restless. As my own mentor Carl Rahner said, we are the question for whom there is no answer. We've got a question mark right here in the center of our heart and written into our guts. And that question is what propels us forward. Uh, it's that tension between having infinite longings of wanting so much in life and having finite capabilities. I can only know so much, only experience so much love, only broaden my base of experience to such a degree. I got these goals, longings, and that's intention. And you and I got to figure out how to live with that tension so it doesn't move us just to the bottle and just to become workaholics and just to escape in a million other ways. It's got to, we've got to learn a way to face up to that. Oh, that fellow in the midlife crisis chasing the skirts around is really dealing with a religious problem, religious problem of facing that limitation in life and somehow being able to deal with that without using that particular form of escape. So the question's real. 
No, it's written here, and it's vital in our culture not to submerge that question, not to push it down. We've got to let it uh, flourish. You've got to have it come out. That's what seems to me so great about a group like this, that people will be encouraged to face that kind of thing, not as a speculative matter, not as somebody else's problem. That's why when I was asked to give the talk of something about campus people, I said, well, I don't want to just talk about those kids. That's too easy in a way. Look at them. Look at their problem. I want to talk about us. You know, the adult people in the world with the professions and uh, living active lives and so on, that's where their first action is. We'll learn how to deal with the young people after we get our own heads together. That's something of what I mean by the spiritual search, something that I believe is a uh, part of our own makeup, and we push it down, set it aside to our own detriment. We impoverish ourselves, and all we can talk about is the weather and superficial matters. Now, I want to try to say one thing constructively in response to that spiritual search. I want to talk about one ideal characteristic that I think we could use as a basis uh, in our own life. It's not the only one. I've got a whole series of these. You know, you can bring me back for the next 10 years once a year to give a uh, uh, comment on these. So yeah, it's not an a, a exhaustive effort at all, but it's one ideal that I see as helpful in dealing with the spiritual uh, difficulties, problems, and quests that we all know. And I like to call that ideal committed openness. Two words put together, committed openness. In other words, part of the ideal as I see it is that we are committed people, committed to family, committed to our neighborhood, committed to our parishes, committed finally to Jesus Christ, committed to our Catholic heritage, rooted in that, solidly at home with that, which in turn precisely allows us to be open-minded people, people who are uh, open to truth and goodness and beauty wherever it is to be found in our world. So that's the kind of picture that I have of an ideal person, kind of one of the characteristics I think we need to live in the contemporary world, committed but open. Uh, see, there's an opposite to all of that, and I, I need to describe that. So let me take those one, one at a time, the openness first, then the commitment, try to show you how I think we need to try to put them together in our lives. Now, the first thing is that we got a lot of uh, around today what I will call a, a renewed exclusivism. That is, we've got uh, people around who think they've got the only answer to life's problems, that their own religious outlook is the only one, that they're in the light and everyone else is in the darkness. And everyone has seen this, runs into it these days. Someone walks up and says, are you saved or not? Implication being that you're not saved. We get it in the TV evangelists all the time. I got a guy coming into my room trying to tell me that uh, I better get converted and straighten out and turn my life over to the Lord if I'm uh, ever going to be saved and get into the rapture or else I'm going to be damned to hell like all the rest of the people. In other words, it, I suppose people meet people like that either in airports or neighbors or someplace around. Uh, it's almost unavoidable these days. There's sort of a new exclusivism. Of course, we in the Catholic heritage, we know something about that, don't we? You remember uh, the old idea that only Catholics were going to get to heaven. What was that one, the joke, the Protestant guy gets up to heaven and he's really happy, joyful, and he's with it. And, and St. Peter comes over and says, uh, quiet, quiet, keep it down. He says, what's wrong, what's wrong? He says, well, we got the Catholics over there in the next room. And he says, if they find out anyone else made it up here, they're going to be mighty upset. Well, you know, those kind of jokes were about our own strange brand of exclusivism. You know, that somehow uh, we had inside track or uh, pipeline to the Almighty and uh, head start on heaven and the odds were much improved or something. So that uh, we have, we know exclusivism all over the place. We know it nationally in terms of, um, you know, that uh, we're the only country in the world who has any truth or goodness in it and so on and that we couldn't possibly learn anything from any other culture. So you look around and you got male exclusivism. I mean, what do those women know? Maybe we shouldn't let them in the club, you know, or something. <laughs> I, uh, so we can get that kind of exclusivism any place. And uh, what I'm 
after here is uh, a much more open attitude. I think uh, just to sort of characterize it that way, the way I've done a caricature already begins to slant it, of course, that there's something narrow about that. There's something less than human in having those kinds of attitudes. Most of us begin to recognize that today. So I would like to see us uh, the kind of people who are calmly confident of what we've got and therefore can enter into dialogue with other human beings so that men and women could talk together as equals and expect to learn something from one another. Oh, that uh, we as Americans would be able to learn something from other systems, other cultures. That when we look at it religiously, that we Catholics would be able to talk to our Protestant friends about religion without being defensive and saying, well, I don't know the Bible as well as they do, I better not talk about it. Uh, no, where we could take the richness of our own heritage and enter into dialogue with these people. Where we would have a great respect for our Jewish friends and not think of them as only people who need to be converted in life so that we could go see Fiddler on the Roof and get a good sense of what tradition is all about and learn something about it. Learn from our Jewish friends about family life and the beautiful way that they have of living that out so that we would be open to drinking, not that we just want to convert those people, but they would be able to tell us something that, is, that really is important. So that people, a lot of people your age in here got your uh, sons or daughters off at college and they go to TM lectures, Transcendental Meditation, and come back and want to tell you about it, that uh, you know we learned this meditation technique, it's really neat, so you don't have to get bent out of shape over that, but um, think that your kid is lost forever, but could actually sit down and say, oh yeah, let me hear about that. What did you learn there? How did they meditate? Maybe I'll try it sometime. You got to sit like that? No way. <laughs> I know. I, I, probably limits to this openness, you know. I got <laughs> I don't want to get carried away with it. But, I mean, so, so that we say, okay, maybe there's something to be learned from that Hindu religious tradition and the whole meditation idea. So that um, we would be able to even affirm that, indeed, atheists in this world can be saved. So we would have a knowledge of our Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium, the document on the church, which says in there, uh, Article 15, that God does not deny His grace of salvation even to those who have not yet learned to call Him by name. So that we don't have to fear that our atheist neighbor is going to hell someday. It says in there that if people follow their conscience that God has a way of working secretly in their hearts and bringing them back to Himself. That puts us Catholics on record of having the most open-minded attitude on salvation that I can imagine. And I'm very proud of that. It seems to me it sets a really good tone to our own ability to deal with other people. God can save even atheists. Save people that I don't uh, get fast enough to the hospital and pour wa water over their head. God's at work in this world, a loving, saving kind of God. So, and it even uh, come closer to home, you know, so that we'd be able to be members of our parishes and be open to the people who are different in our parishes. What do we got? Conservatives, progressives, charismatics, communal Catholics, all different styles, brands, and so on, so that we would be the people to be able to be not just tolerant of that, but happy about it. Celebrate the fact that we're different. Celebrate the fact that people got different outlooks, philosophies, theologies, pieties. That seems neat because then we don't remain just static. Then we don't just pat each other on the back and say we're neat. Then we're challenged to think, to grow, develop. That's what keeps us young, isn't it? The ability to keep with it and uh, keep stimulated intellectually. I, that could happen right in our own parishes. Why do we have to be mad that some people think different from ourselves in our parishes? Let's celebrate the fact and try to dialogue, get along. So that's something of what I mean about openness. Now that isn't just a nice pop psychology idea. That comes from a solid theology, which I can't work out entirely, but I can give you the sketchy outline of it here because it's crucial. You have to pay attention a little bit now. That is that God wills the salvation of all people, 1 Timothy 2.4. God's a God who wants to bring people back to himself. And because of that, he's given himself to us. He's given not just a thing to us, but given his very life. He's communicated himself to each individual who has ever lived. 
we got a name for that, a technical word. We call it grace. Grace is God's self-communication to us. And because he's given us grace, it makes a difference in our lives. Our consciousness is modified. It seeps into our blood and bones. It gets into our head that this God calls us and knocks at our heart. And because of that, we have what we call universal revelation. God who speaks to us always and everywhere through through the weather, through the people around us, through our own sinfulness and mistakes, through all the joys of life. And not only that, but when we respond to that call of God, follow our conscience, try to do what's right, follow the inspiration of our heart that we have at work then, a saving faith, faith that brings us to God. That's the the kind of picture that we have, in other words, of a God working all over the world to bring people back to himself. And the great human need is to be alert to that, to see it in ourselves, our own hearts, and in other people even people who are so different from us. So why should we dialogue with the Protestant, the Jew, the Hindu, the atheist, people who are different from ourselves? Because they also have the grace of God in their hearts, because God can speak through them as well. There is a revelation there, and we need to be on alert for it. So what am I going to tell these people, therefore, that I talked to the dentist? The dentist who is in danger of exclusivism, i got to tell him, be careful. Yeah, you turned your life over to the Lord, but other people got their own way of following the Lord. They don't know May 3rd, sudden thing, but they've been working at it regularly, raising their families, doing a good job, earning a living, going to church. That's, That's also part of the Christian way of doing things. Don't think you got the only way. You know, to Jeff, who wants uh, me to be a model example to him, I've got to tell him, okay, you know, look at my life, get out of it what you can, but you've got to live your own life, find your own way, and that's lifelong. You're not going to find one way of doing it forever. we got to be people who are growing and developing. And what do I need to do in my life? I've got to try to stay open. I've got to remember my job as a priest is to deal with all different kinds of people, not form cliques, not just my own little grouping, openness to all the people around me. Second kind of thing that uh, they have all this. So that's the openness side of it. The other side of it is commitment. What does it mean to be a person of commitment? That means that we have a fidelity about us, a sense of responsibility that if we say something to somebody else, we're going to try to follow through on it. That we have uh, a loyalty to our friends, something that says, hey, we give them the benefit of the doubt when they're not looking too good or they seem to be off the track. The, the kind of friendship that would say I'd be able to go up to my friend and say, hey, you know, I think you've got to be careful of this or shape up in this way or that. No, part of being a dedicated person means uh, that we are committed to our families, that we recognize the strength of blood, that we're willing uh, to, uh, to try to be peacemakers in that family setting. It means, it seems to me, that we're dedicated to our parishes, that we don't just say, well, I'll go to another parish because mine doesn't seem to be any good, but that one is willing to speak up and be involved and try to make the parish life better, criticize the clergy, the pastors, when that's needed, encourage us uh, when, uh, we, when you think we do something good. That's part of this commitment. And it is uh, to be in touch with our Catholic heritage. The committed person, it seems to me, is able to say something like this. The Catholic heritage is rich and beautiful. It's powerful. I don't need to go to TM to find out how to meditate, to tell you the truth. We've got it right in our own tradition. We've uh, got, a po- we got a rich diversity there. We've got help for living in the modern world. We've got just what the world's crying for. And we need to know that. We need to be educated to it. We ought to know the richness of this tradition. Again, learning, adult education, a part of that. We need to deal with embarrassment over the past. Some people are Catholics are gun shy. They say, geez, I was wrong on birth control. We might be wrong on something else. You know, it it becomes, you know, well, I'm embarrassed about some of the things I used to hold when I was younger. Uh, There's all kinds of possible embarrassments in that Catholic heritage. You can go back to crusades and inquisitions and wars and Northern Ireland right now and all of that. But we need to deal with that, not the embarrassment. We've got to be able to say, yeah, our heritage isn't perfect. We've had our mistakes and faults. I'm not ter- totally proud of all the ways I've lived out my Catholic heritage, but there's a goodness there, a richness that I can tap, 
that indeed can help me to live more effectively in this world of ours. So commitment seems to me a vital word, something that people are losing sight of in today's world, that we feel rooted, that we know who we are. We're proud of that. I go around talking to the high schools. I says, you ought to f hire for 20 thou a committed Catholic just to walk the halls. No, they don't have to do anything else. Just be there so that young people can bounce off that person. So that person would be able not to brainwash the kids, not to force it down their throat, but that person wouldn't be a marshmallow either. They wouldn't be able to just be a pushover like everything the kids think today is better than how we used to do it. They would be able to proudly, confidently, quietly, without feeling defensive, be able to say, this is what I believe. This is how I live. And I found this to be an effective way of making sense out of my experience and understanding life and living as a good person. That's what we need. I tell them, if you can't find uh, you know, the 20 thou, then what we got to do is get the parents and the rest of the teachers to be able to do that. We don't want to hire that other person. But we need committed people around in order to help the next generation. Now again, there is a theology behind all of this. What I've just said is not just, again, pop psychology or easy thing for Catholic priests to say to a captive Catholic audience. No, it is based, it seems to me, in this kind of theology, that the great God who reveals himself always and everywhere also reveals himself in very particular, concrete ways. That's one of the great strengths of our Catholic heritage. We know God speaks through the ordinary, the routine, the daily, in the concrete, real life as you and I have to live it. God reveals himself to the degree that people are open to that. So the more open we are, the more his grace and revelation can come into us. And we uh, Catholics are the people who say, hey, there was one of us, the best we ever produced, who was more open than anybody else. He was so receptive to the will of the Father and the giving of the Father that it's true to say he was God in our midst. God personally walking our path with us, the God who pitched his tent in this world. And we name that person, we say, that's Jesus of Nazareth. He is the fullness of God's revelation. There is uh, the one where we find what the divine human relationship is really all about. Find the whole of the story of the human race uh, summarized, represented in this one divine human person, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. That means that we are not just mindless relativists. This means that a, a, a sort of total relativism is out. It's not one thing's as good as another. It's not your idea, my idea, so what? We claim that there's a fullness to revelation. Not that there isn't revelation elsewhere in the Buddhist world, the Muslim world, Hindu, Jewish community, and so on, but that we have the fullness of that in Jesus Christ. And it is represented for us in the New Testament. So we say we've got a criteria to use in making judgments upon our culture and in making, uh, finding the principles that we need to live by. There's a concreteness about it. So the reason we're committed Catholic people, it seems to me, is we think that Jesus Christ is the absolute Savior, the final prophet, the fullness of revelation is found in him. He's got the key to living. He told us how it's supposed to work, how we're supposed to live. That's the theology, again, that I think that we need. Uh, you understand that? There's a particularity about that. Commitment to Jesus of Nazareth, and not as the exclusive mode of revelation, not the only place truth is to be found, but for us the fullness of that truth. Now, what do I tell some of those people? My friend, middle-aged uh, fellow running around, Tell them, hey, you've got to make a decision, man. You're going to die the thousand deaths this way. No, you got to, it's commitment that will free you, not uh, running around. That's not going to do it. You're going to have ashes in your mouth in five years. Oh, well, it seems to me it's only through the commitment that we're willing to make that frees us up to find any of the exhilaration and liberation in life. I don't think there is any true freedom, liberation without commitment. So he's got to figure out where he's going to make that commitment and get on with life and not be sitting on the fence. What do I tell my friend, professor, who is feels scattered all over the place? 
seems to me I have to say again you know you need a focus for all that there needs to be a religious center to your life you need a commitment to an ultimate value not 33 different values not 33 different activities with the same priority level you need a priority in your life and that has to be religious in some way there has to be the center there that will enable you then to do be a good family person a good professor a good member of this political organization and so on the commitment there seems crucial and for myself I have to remind myself that if I'm going to deal with these tugs these pulls uh, these uh, on my time and energy I've got to be a person of prayer I've got to be a person who meditates regularly I got to charge up those batteries somehow I got to try to let the spirit come into the center of my being so that it can radiate outward. I got to find within me a religious source of the energy that I got to keep expending in my work. I don't see any other way to go about it, and so I have to keep reminding myself not just to be an activist, not just involved, busy, busy, go, go. There's got to be that quiet time to drink it in, to get refreshed, to know the power of the spirit in our lives. Please turn the cassette tape over. And finally, those two things don't just sit there, it seems to me, side by side. I'm not open on Monday when I'm talking to the Kiwanis Club and committed on Sunday when I'm celebrating Mass. It seems to me those two things have to work together all the time in my life. I have to be... My commitment comes because I am, am indeed open, and vice versa. It's something like this. The more confident I am of my tradition, the more I know who I am, the less defensive I'll be in dealing with other people and groups. The more confident I am, the more I can drink in the truth and goodness and beauty wherever it is to be found. And then when I listen well, when I'm able to drink it in a bit, then I usually can relate it to something in my own tradition which enriches my way of looking at the world. We know this in conversation. When, some, when we're talking with somebody else and we don't feel sure of ourselves, we get defensive, then we either strike out or we withdraw. Right? But in conversation, when I feel confident, at ease, I can dialogue, I can be challenged and respond. That's the ideal that I have in my mind. Committed openness. Spiritual search is exciting. You know, it's where the action is. You know, all the rest of it, fine, okay. But the spiritual life is what counts. That's what's human. That's what we're all about. And we need to be the people who take seriously that question mark in the center of our being. And I think that's what's great about our Catholic heritage and continuing to carry it on. It encourages us to be those people who take the spiritual search seriously. I thank you for your time and attention.